Welcome to this day's Future of Leadership podcast. Our guest today is a very special person. He has the doctor's degree in veterinarian medicine, and he worked for the United Nations before starting his career in the pharmaceutical industry. Today, he's the CEO of the oldest pharmaceutical company in the world, the Merck Group, with an origin dating back to 1668. Merck today has 57,000 employees and an annual turnover of 16 billion euro. Last year, he stated in a speech, a global pandemic is one of the largest threats in our times. We do not know when it will come, but it is very likely that it will come. Dr. Stefan Oschmann, it's great to have you here with us today. Thank Hello. you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> So are you a prophet or how have you been able to predict the corona pandemic? No, I'm by no means a prophet. Uh, I was just, you know, given, mm -hmm. given our uh, technology focus in our company and we have three businesses in Merck, health, healthcare, biopharma, life science tools, and basically electronic materials. We are in touch with quite a few experts in the world uh, who deal with important developments and identify challenges and opportunities. Mm. So I was part of uh, an expert group, I think it was in 2016 or so, mm -hmm. when the German government was preparing for, was it the G7 or G20 summit? Mm -hmm. uh, there was um, Bill Gates, there was uh, WHO, the International Red Cross and others, and it was at the height of the Ebola pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and there we were asked to give recommendations about future pandemic. And ever since I was very much involved in this uh, in this scene, uh, we introduced this topic at the Munich Security Conference, which is, which is sort of the leading global security venue, because mm -hmm. we thought it was uh, it required a sort of security type of uh, uh, type of uh, reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yes, this pandemic has happened. Um, it is a, uh, what can I say, a very negative development on the one hand. On the other hand, it could have come much worse. You know, uh, Bill Gates had predicted in an in a important uh, a contribution to the New England Journal of Medicine, mm -hmm. I think it was in 2017, where he said that, imagine we have a pandemic that is as uh, contagious as, uh, as influenza, but as deadly as Ebola, what would happen? How can we prepare for this? So it could have come much worse, and maybe this gives the world a chance to prepare, uh, to prepare themselves better. And do you think that the modern lifestyle is somehow accelerating this kind of pandemics, or is it just... Uh human threat that human ha humanity has faced uh, ever since it's there? Well, uh, you know, I mean, we had pandemics in world history. Uh, mm. Just uh, the, 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 the recent really, really major one was the so-called Spanish flu in, mm. in 1918, 19, 19, uh, 1919. And there have been so many pandemics. Now, travel patterns and, op and other, other aspects uh, accelerate accelerate these things on the other hand where would we be right now without the digital infrastructure that uh, that we have so a pandemic like that that would have hit us earlier would have probably been worse mm -hmm. but it's interesting and in, in a recent linkedin article you stated that the first panic and first the panic and then forgetting is a typical pattern how the world reacts to health hazards and um I myself was also very astonished that uh, the Spanish flu that you just mentioned, I mean, uh, there were like 15 million people dying from this flu, but I had the feeling that in, in the historical memory of, of uh, humans, the, the world wars are much more present than such kind of pan uh, pandemics. So why do you think humans tend to forget pandemics while they in their historic um, memory, wars or other events are very present and stay very present. I don't know, to be honest, I'm not mm -hmm. a psychologist or social scientist. Uh -huh. So, uh, but there's there's plenty of literature about this. And uh, if you read the, 
uh, Camus, for instance, uh, that, that is really required reading these days to define the psychological or, or to describe the psychological patterns in this. But there is in today's world, there is a typical cycle of uh, panic and neglect for so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, public opinion is, shifts very fast from mm -hmm. one from one topic uh, uh, to the uh, to the next. And the fact that plenty of people, experts, have been discussing pandemic preparedness or the threat of a pandemic for, for, for several years. I don't think it's so specific to this topic. This is this mm -hmm. is just how things work. If you uh, if you scan the web for um, discussion or in the past decade, I think there was uh, uh, at least an order of magnitude more discussion about computer viruses than mm -hmm. real, real viruses. Mm -hmm. This is how the world is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now with this experience, and this is the worst recession that uh, any was, one of us has uh, uh, experienced in our lifetime, at least those who were uh, uh, born after uh, after World War II, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe this is, this, this is one of my, my themes. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to take this more seriously. Mm -hmm. So, so as you, how is your current mood and how has your daily business as the CEO of a really large global company changed since the COVID-19 lockdown? Well, first of all, we were relatively well prepared. We went into a crisis mode very early. So, so we, we, had, we, have, we have a sizable business in China and a very good large organization there. And we, we had in constant contact with our Without, had been in constant contact with our people and, and had uh, uh, taken some learnings uh, uh, from uh, from there. Our business, the three businesses that we, we're running are deemed essential or system relevant. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, we didn't lock down our operations. We, uh, we maintained our supply chain, manufacturing, research and uh, research and development. You know, in, in our healthcare business, we, we're developing and making um, life-saving uh, medicines. We're involved in, in a lot of uh, COVID research to, mm -hmm. in our life science tool business, we're making uh, the tools and the processes for scientists, for biotech companies, vaccine companies, mm -hmm. pharma companies, everybody who's working mm -hmm. also on COVID right now. And in our so-called performance materials business, we're We're the world's largest uh, maker of electronic materials. So all these servers and uh, um, uh, laptops and uh, uh, tablets and whatever we be using right now mm -hmm. for communication, there's Mac materials in there and we're working very closely with the Intels and the Apples and the Googles of this world mm -hmm. to, to develop the next innovation. So you can imagine that especially during that crisis, Uh, we couldn't go into a lockdown ourselves. Obviously, mm -hmm. we were closing our, uh, our offices. So we've been even we've been busier than ever before. At the same time, my personal life has changed. I've been uh, I've been in home office for a while, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I'm back into my office here in Darmstadt in Germany uh, since uh, several weeks now. But I would normally have traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I would have perceived this as absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. you know, like I would go to China like once a month or so to the mm -hmm. U.S., uh, almost uh, as frequently as that. And now I spend my days in settings like this, like we talk uh, we talk right now. And I was expecting that this was very it was going to be much more unproductive than it really is. Now mm -hmm. I spend my days and I'm talking to country teams, regional teams, business sector teams, Uh, routinely uh, uh, through digital means and in a way I feel I'm more productive than ever mm -hmm. before. I don't think that this is sort of going to be the full new normal that, mm -hmm. uh, that way but um, I I have such I'm in such close contact with so many people in my organization right now and this is like a real life experiment mm -hmm. in, in digital working so it's mm -hmm. very interesting to me. Is is there anything that you miss in this kind of communication? So do you think it, it has advantages, for example, for information sharing? But is it also easy if you want to get over a personal message? Or do you see any any differentiation here? Obviously, it's very different. I think this mm -hmm. it works very well for people, for teams who already know each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Teams that 
that have been working together for a while can work extremely well in this uh, in this setting. Um, there is uh, one has to be a lot more structured in meetings like that. That has an advantage. There is much less fighting for airtime or ego or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other mm -hmm. hand, you know, there, mm -hmm. are these, there are these informal chats that one would normally have, that one uh, gets to know new people that one wouldn't have met otherwise. And then there's all these contacts with customers. Obviously, we're doing as a company, we're doing a lot of digital outreach mm -hmm. uh, to customers. But at my level, uh, you know, uh, this is this is not so easy right now. So uh, I hope that I will soon go back, that I can be able to go back to to also personal meetings, but at the same time, I will maintain this routine of calling on Teams frequently through Microsoft mm -hmm. Teams or Blue Jeans or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you saved a lot of time for traveling, so that, that you could use for, for other uh, things as well, because that was sure, a big thing yeah. that I got. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 I spend a lot, of more, a lot more time with people, with Teams mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I I have less sort of uh, purely ceremonial appointments mm -hmm. uh, where the CEO has to appear to uh, to address uh, a crowd more more or less for decorative purposes. That is gone. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I spend real time in in depth discussion with teams from smaller countries that I would visit very irregularly. And they share their experiences with uh, with me. We have identified three priorities in this in this crisis: first, the safety and health of our employees and their families; secondly, business continuity and business recovery; and thirdly, to act as an active force to support society, academia, researchers, uh, industry in finding a solution to this. And they're sharing their they're sharing their experiences, their their concerns, their hopes. You know, it's it's very very useful to me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you are somehow now in the heart of fighting a virus like COVID-19. And there's many people that hope that uh, there will be a vacant soon. So um, because they think then you can ease again kind of all the safe, safety uh, regulations. So what is your prediction on that? On vaccines specifically? Or yeah. on therapeutics? Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe I, I try to cover all of it. Or perhaps you just describe how you see the Better, fight yeah. against COVID-19, because I mean, that is, I think, very interesting for us. So first is there's, there's the vaccine, the quest for a vaccine. Um, you go back a couple of years, uh, it would take you, let's say, if you uh, if one was going to be successful at all with a vaccine development project, it would take you like seven to 12 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, given the discussions that we had in the industry and the, the foundation of initiatives such as CEPI and, and technological progress, things have advanced very much. So we're now talking about uh, having a vaccine, let's say, if, we, uh, if we're lucky within a year or so, if we're super lucky earlier than that, if we're not that lucky later than that. Um, I feel that, and I'm sorry, I must be a little bit technical about this, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, no props. <laughs> if we were dealing with a virus, uh, a pathogen like, let's say, Ebola, mm -hmm. that kills 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the people who get infected, mm -hmm. you would really rush to developing a vaccine mm -hmm. and you would then use that vaccine broadly in healthy people mm -hmm. okay? because the, the threat is so enormous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, creates what we call mortality, a, let's say a death rate of mm -hmm. depends. You know, we don't really know yet. Let's say between 0.5 and 5%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is bad enough, but it's not as bad so that you would use a vaccine that is not fully tested mm -hmm. in hundreds of millions or billions of people. Mm -hmm. So if we have a vaccine, and there are very promising projects ongoing, if we have a vaccine, such a vaccine, my prediction is that it will first be used uh, in uh, high risk in high risk populations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 hospital staff, and, uh, mm -hmm. and 
others and maybe the uh, and maybe the elderly and it and it will be used on a voluntary basis i mean all these conspiracy theories that are out there are absolutely absolute complete utter nonsense yeah uh, and uh, and people are discussing things uh, you know I, I don't know my, my response to these radical sort of crazy anti-vaccine pe people is you want a world without without vaccines you look how bad it is in a mm. world where we're missing one vaccine. Yeah? Mm. So so I have high hope for a vaccine. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be naive about this. Mm -hmm. There are totally novel technologies such as messenger RNA, there, there, there's uh, Moderna in the US, uh, BioNTech in Germany, CureVac in Germany, they're sort of at the, uh, at the leading, uh, mm -hmm. leading edge there. With some luck, we will see results there. There have been some very promising data. Then there are other interventions. My, my mm -hmm. company is very, my, my company in, uh, supports 45 vaccines projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jenner Institute uh, in, in in the UK, Baylor College, and so many uh, and so many others. Mm -hmm. uh, what we shouldn't forget also, there's also a, a, a quest for developing therapeutics, antiviral uh, substances. There's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one product where we already have data, which uh, from Desivir, from from a from a U.S. company from Gilead, which seems to have uh, a, a, a significant effect on reducing mortality. There are other programs. The WHO is conducting a large trial called Solidarity Trial. So if we have a little bit of luck again, and I think it's probable that uh, there will be successes, we might have within weeks or months, we might have an armamentarium of antiviral mm -hmm. substances. Mm -hmm. that can be used in, 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 in ill patients mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. reduce mortality. Mm -hmm. And then we might come into a scenario like influenza, mm -hmm. where we also, where we, where, you know, people die of influenza every year. Mm, for sure. A few, but we don't go into a lockdown for mm -hmm. that. And the, and the last technology that is also very interesting is there's uh, uh, some very promising projects on developing neut uh, neutralizing antibodies. So these are antibodies mm -hmm. that we use mm -hmm. either again to protect high risk people for a couple of weeks or to treat uh, to treat affected uh, affected patients. So my assumption is that we will during the course of this year we will make significant progress. In this. But that's very interesting what you say. So we should not only focus on a vaccine, but there are other. Um, tools or weapons to fight Corona, because we had sometimes this discussion now in the recent weeks that, for example, for HIV, I think there never was uh, a vaccine found. So can somebody, can you predict if a virus is a virus where it's easier to find a, a vaccine or w where it's more difficult? Or why was it, for example, not possible to find a vaccine for HIV, even yeah. though it's like it's been there like 40 years now? Yeah, HIV is a very, very different type of uh, a type of virus. But actually, coronaviruses aren't so easy to mm -hmm. deal with either in terms of vaccines development. We have some experience. There, there are quite a few coronaviruses in animals, for instance, in cats. And many people have tried to develop vaccines and have not been successful. I am personally somewhat uh, quite optimistic when it comes to this mRNA, messenger RNA technology, which mm -hmm. is very, very novel, it's, re it's revolutionary. It's a totally different uh, approach. You know, in classical vaccines, you take, a uh, you take either the virus that has been attenuated or, uh, or uh, well, you can't kill because the virus is not alive, but uh, modified, and you inject that then into, uh, into patients or you take a certain uh, uh, element of the surface of the uh, of the virus and the body then creates antibodies uh, mm -hmm. against uh, against mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, or you take so-called viral vectors that is uh, harmless viruses which are being modified so that they contain something mm -hmm. from the virus you want to vaccinate Again, that's that's a big progress the mrna thing is even more revolutionary you don't use uh, you don't use any virus you use a messenger RNA that is a mm -hmm. genetic, uh, 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 like a, a genetic code mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. you would that you would give and that then cre then that enables the body to produce antibodies directly. Mm -hmm. That is being studied uh, in uh, in cancer, uh, in cancer mm -hmm. treatment 
now the companies uh, that that uh, kind of own this technology have developed this technology. They uh, they have moved very fast uh, to develop uh, vaccines against uh, co uh, COVID uh, against uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, so uh, that would be a major that would be major progress. And I have uh, I think the the, the 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 intermediate data look very promising. Now. Um... I think it's very interesting that you have worked directly with Bill Gates and the WHO. So, I mean, there were these conspiracy theories that you just mentioned that people, and, and I saw some, you know, YouTube videos by accident where people kind of do as if Bill Gates would buy the pharma industry and he would buy big foundations to do whatever. Um, so what can you say these people that, you know, that broadcast this kind of conspiracy theories? And what do you say to your employees? Because they are at the heart of, of fighting a coronavirus and they must be very angry when they read or hear about things like that. Or what, what are the emotions that you, that you face then listening uh, and hearing about this kind of uh, theories that circulate? Well, you know, I've, I've met Bill Gates first time many years ago, and it was a time when he brought together, I think it was 12 CEOs of different pharma and biotech companies, and we were focusing on so-called NTDs, neglected tropical diseases. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these are usually parasitic worm diseases. And uh, Bill Gates sort of challenged the industry and said, uh, uh, Let's get together and let's develop a partnership so that we can address this. Um, I, my company uh, started a big program against, or actually enhanced the program against uh, schistosomiasis, Bill Hodge, a worm disease, kills, mm -hmm. kills 100,000 children in Africa alone every year. Uh, other companies have uh, uh, developed uh, medications or donated medications through WHO and others. And we've made so much progress on this. So there has been an existing, there has been existing trust between Bill Gates and his foundation and uh, and uh, CEOs of the industry because we have successfully uh, uh, tackled quite a few such uh, quite a few such uh, uh, such diseases. I have extremely high regard for Gates. You know, he could have taken his billions and yeah. and bought himself the biggest yacht in the world yeah. or. You know, he could have gone playing golf all the time, or, uh, uh, or I don't know, I don't know what. No, he decided that he would work toward uh, uh, important goals, and his mm. and health is one of his uh, of his main goals. He does spend a lot of money on this. He, uh, the Gates Foundation is using contemporary management methods mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to monitor projects uh, to make sure that they allocate resources uh, the right way. Not everybody likes that uh, mm. all the time. I've had plenty of contacts with the World Health Organization, and mm. I think we need a strong World Health Organization. Mm. They were underfunded mm. for quite some time, and they were somewhat over-politicized. Mm. So, uh, you know, having, uh, having a, or attempting to reform and strengthen WHO mm -hmm. and point out weaknesses that exist there mm -hmm. is a very different ball game compared to others who want to abolish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates supports WHO very much. WHO is owned not by Bill Gates, but by its member states. It's entirely mm -hmm. run. It's entirely run. Uh, by governments, NGOs are invited. Mm. There is a super active debate in this Geneva bubble. Some people, some people, <laughs> times. Mm. And you know, uh, and there are many people who actually believe that the NGO influence over WHO is far too big, mm. or that the influence mm. of governments like China, historically Brazil and India, is is far mm. too big. That's what you get from such large multinational organizations. But we must make sure that we strengthen WHO so that they can really help the world on their, one of their main mandates. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, to, uh, to protect the world from pandemics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so my impression is, though, that Bill Gates Foundation 
fund projects in areas where which would not be economically profitable to make by for example pharmaceutical industries is that right that they in particular invest in things that otherwise would, there would not be a market for so to accelerate kind of the development in these areas or did i get that wrong that is uh, uh, that is correct uh, but he is basically what his approach is is he's drawing the attention to these uh, uh, to these uh, to these problems mm -hmm. and you know I, i've been i've been chairman of the world pharmaceutical industry association for uh, for quite a while um and and i'm i'm very much aware of these theories and the criticism mm -hmm. toward industry and so and sometimes the uh, the criticism is correct usually in my in my view it is uh, uh, it is misguided, but companies need a license to operate. Any mm -hmm. company needs, in the long term, uh, needs to uh, achieve uh, a degree of societal consensus that it mm -hmm. is useful and necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have functioning health systems in uh, in the uh, uh, in many low income mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. They huge problems. Yeah, if you look at reality versus perception, at reality, what people like the Gates Foundation, but also major pharmaceutical uh, companies, other med tech companies are doing in Africa and other low income countries, it is actually very good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to get these messages across the media because the media are not interested in good stories mm -hmm. in a, in yeah, a, in a, that's this really how, a mess yeah. this is not i mean this is just this is how we uh, how we function uh you know, during normal times nobody is interested to read in the news media that the 1569th flight has landed safely mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. frankfurt airport people are interested if some flight crashes yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, uh, that's how uh, how life is so i didn't care much about that we do have a need to strengthen global health, mm -hmm. and uh, we we need to address healthcare issues in low-income countries because it contributes to safety. And this brings mm -hmm. us back to this health safety or, glo uh, 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 or glo uh, global health topic. Now, uh, uh, e Ebola is such an uh, uh, such a good example for that because it came out of countries where there is basically no health infrastructure, no healthcare infrastructure. And, and is Ebola really still a big threat also on a global level? So could this virus, for example, expand and, and mutate in a way that it really would become a uh, risk like, like it, Corona, is it? Or because I think many, for many people, it's far away in Africa, you know, and they have the feeling it's, it's not not close to us. And I think yeah. the corona was so strong because people had the feeling that they could catch it immediately within days when they just would go shopping on the wrong uh, place or go into a bar. But some some threats are very far, then people are not so concerned. If they have the feeling I could get it immediately, then they really start uh, being very attentive to, to such. You, I don't want to create panic and panic doesn't uh, panic doesn't help us at all. Uh, but you, you go back a couple of months, a majority of people would have thought that Corona was a China phenomenon, mm -hmm. and people were, you know, people were just just concerned about the situation in China, and 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 a, and a vast majority of people would have never thought that this that this would arrive uh, would arrive oh. here. Uh, so uh, uh, Ebola is still uh, is still rampant. Things like that can uh, uh, can come back, and and there are very concrete things that can be done to reduce the risk of something like this happening. And if it happens, uh, there's so much we have learned. One aspect is, and it takes me back to the previous topic, is to mm -hmm. strengthen health systems mm -hmm. in low uh, in in low income country, mm -hmm. countries, and that requires an unideological approach, and often you know, public private partnerships. Uh, have helped so much, and this is where this is where the Gates Foundation plays a role, where where, where different industries mm -hmm. uh, play a role. You know, even if you come from very different ideological or political angles, mm -hmm. if you decide, okay, here's things we disagree, but we agree that there is this problem, and let's, if we have the means, let's, uh, even if we don't like each other, 
let's try to solve it. Mm -hmm. I, I have seen in my in my professional life that such approaches can really help. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, at least for a person who is not so much in the topic like me, it was very interesting that, I mean, there was a very quick kind of similar reaction to COVID-19 by many countries now. Um, so you as an expert in global uh, health security, have you been happy with the overall reaction or uh, what could have been better if if your vision of, of a global health security would would be in place? What would have um, been different from how it happened? They're very different reactions. I mean, if you look at certain Asian countries and I don't want to impose the Chinese societal model on us. That's a totally different mm -hmm. story. But mm -hmm. let's say if you look at Taiwan, Taiwan mm -hmm. has done an excellent job. Now, obviously, Taiwan is an island, uh, uh, but they have done extremely well. They were well prepared. Korea was well prepared. Thailand uh, uh, mm -hmm. has, done, has done a very, uh, a very good, uh, a very good job. So what what something we should learn out of this is we need to be prepared. So I think we were, let's put it mildly, suboptimally prepared mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to what we call PPE, like masks and gloves and, and mm -hmm. you know, for, uh, for clinic hospital. Uh, we were not well prepared, uh, prepared enough. However, then the reaction of different governments, I think, was, as you say, quite similar. Not exactly the same, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. the same everywhere. There was a lot of discussion about initially in Europe about the UK and the Sweden model being better mm -hmm. with herd immunity. That has proven to be, from my point of view, has proven to be ineffective. Um, it just has increased uh, increased uh, uh, mortality, but all governments have acted similarly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you know, in Germany, our government has done a has, has done a decent job. Mm -hmm. Again, the people who have very different opinions compared to me, I think they've done I think they've done well. Mm -hmm. uh, now we need to shift to again, on, on the one hand to have this different type of approach of a focused vigilance, maybe, um, uh, and and act more on a local or, reg uh, or regional basis, and we must manage the economic the economic impact of uh, of this uh, the stimulus money all these packages it's uh, it's uh, obviously the right thing but we must be aware of the fact that this is currently money that is being printed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have to pay it back at some uh, at some point uh, at some point in time so that's going to be the next challenge mm -hmm. and i mean i think this covid-19 was at least it was a a real example of what is called a VUCA world, so volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Many managers are talking about it, but now uh, there was the chance to kind of realize it in, in, a, in a real life example. Um, what do you, from your perspective as a CEO, uh, if you think about corporate strategies, what can one learn from this COVID-19 lockdown. So what should be assumptions that a top management of a company perhaps should revise or rethink? Where should they, where are perhaps even brave decisions needed looking ahead in the future? You know, when I started uh, in my career and I was for the first time as a young person involved in a strategic plan, uh, I was working for a U.S. company based in the U.S. at that time. Uh, we developed a 10-year strategic plan, and the world looked very linear. And it's, it mm -hmm. was actually not that long ago, mm -hmm. but it was really useful mm -hmm. to develop a 10-year strategic plan. And that 10-year strategic plan was based, was, was based on one single scenario, mm -hmm. an extra, mm -hmm. extrapolation of, uh, of, of trends. And it was about mm -hmm. the minutiae of the extrapolation that really, uh, uh, that really mattered. I have in my company over the past years, we've discussed this topic very often and we said mm -hmm. the world, and, and that was long before, or quite some time uh, uh, before uh, Corona, we said this doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, it's it's more about agility and resilience mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. an organization. You know, obviously you need to have proper processes, you need to have technical experts, you need to have quality, etc. 
But at the same time, you need to have an organization that is agile and flexible mm -hmm. so that something like this happens, they can act very fast. And I, it may sound a bit emotional what I'm saying, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm very touched by how our people are acting in this, uh, in this crisis. Mm -hmm. right? I'm deeply mm -hmm. convinced that people are, that a vast majority of people are inherently motivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not the role of senior, senior management to motivate people. The role of senior mm -hmm. management is to make sure that people don't get demotivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, people, senior management needs to help select the right people, develop, uh, develop the right people. Senior management needs to create a, a work environment that is conducive to, to success. And then very importantly, there's all this cheesy discussion about purpose and so uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. these days. But I've been a big fan of purpose uh, since, since, since quite some time. And I experienced this with our people. If there is this enhanced sense of purpose, i.e. we as individuals and we as an organization, we're doing something that is the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That mobilizes so much energy in an organization. It's simply, uh, it's, it, it's simply amazing. And uh, seeing our people act, and you, uh, mm -hmm. obviously we have corporate strategies, we have, uh, uh, we have principles, we have values, we have processes, all of this. But I'm talking to, I don't know, to Peru today, and then later to Israel, and then, uh, and then mm -hmm. uh, uh, to Thailand, and uh, and then to the U.S., and then to China. And to see how an organization can move in this wonderful mixture of discipline and freedom at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. I don't want to portray ourselves as an ideal organization, not mm -hmm. at all what I mean, but I think in today's world, it's really about creating an organization that can, uh, that can act, adjust, react, and act very rapidly in a changing mm -hmm. world. And, and I... What do you exactly mean with a balance between discipline and, and uh, freedom? So is it about discipline giving means, autonomy, but on the other hand, having a clear management system? Or, or? What, what, what I mean is you need to have a common set of values. Uh, you need to have a defined, a, a defined strategy. So there needs to be a certain framework. These are the things we do. These are the things we don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then enable local creativity mm -hmm. and curiosity. And I see, I mean, when it comes, for instance, to uh, can imagine in this situation, it is really, really important to be very good at digital customer outreach. If you, uh, uh, hospitals these days, uh, our life science and uh, uh, our performance materials customers, they're actually not that busy right now. Mm -hmm. You know, they're more open to talk, mm -hmm. uh, they're more open to talk, uh, but they're difficult, uh, difficult to reach. So if you have a global backbone, uh, a, a technical infrastructure, if people are trained on that, if you have the right uh, materials for the, or the, or the right content for them, for that, but then you know, the situation in Peru and the situation in China are very different. Mm -hmm. Then local teams, and it can be global teams as well that mm -hmm. are working in different businesses, need to have the freedom to adapt mm -hmm. and and creatively develop their approach to this and then share best practices again. Fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, we are living in a time where people ask for positive outlooks and you said i mean it's also a time where people feel some purpose because they 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 in a crisis mode you also can unleash some potential that you perhaps even have not been um yeah um clear about but um Let's talk about your personal vision uh, of a world we all could live in looking ahead in 10 years or so. I don't want to pontificate about that. And I'm, uh, as I said early on, I'm not a prophet. So I cannot predict how the world is going to look like in, uh, in, uh, in 10 years from now. Um, I just, I have hope. And I don't think that this is naive, that mm -hmm. despite all the negative aspects of this crisis, if we can maintain at least a fraction of this sense of togetherness that we 
that we're feeling, why we are physically separated, mm -hmm. actually. But mm -hmm. so many people are working together. They're pushing egos mm -hmm. and politics and I don't know what aside, and they're trying to get something done. If, if individual organizations or if individuals in organizations like companies or if societies can maintain some of that spirit, mm -hmm. then this might be a, diff uh, a different and a better world. Mm -hmm. Great. And do you also think that the economic system has to change a little bit? I mean, you were talking about resilience. So, I mean, a lot of companies and, and managers had the paradigm of um, efficiency. Uh, so, so really, you know, being able to make high profits and, and have small re reserves and less redundancies, for example. So, so uh, do you think management has to rethink there as well in the future? I guess so, actually. I mean, actually, I think you know, efficiency and resilience are not uh, uh, opposed to each other. You can be highly efficient and resilient at the same time, but we need to rethink our supply chains, mm -hmm. uh, you know, multiple sourcing, uh, uh, and, uh, and build in more resilience into our, uh, into our supply chains. I think that's going to happen. We also see that there's so much techno-nationalism these days. Mm -hmm. You've heard, you know, I mean, the US government, the Indian government, the French government, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the example of a vaccine, where, where they said, you know, if there's a vaccine, we want it, uh, yeah. We, uh, we want it. We want it first. We see this U.S.-China conflict um, uh, getting uh, uh, getting worse. So companies are looking into their whole value streams, this, uh, uh, their value chain, and that this will this will create changes. Uh, difficult to assess exactly how this is going to look like, but I think it will change our logic. Mm -hmm. At the same time, people are saying that. Uh, Uh, this crisis is happening because of globalization. I think that's complete nonsense again. Mm -hmm. Where would we be with that in this crisis without globalization? Uh, and we need more. We need more globalization. At the same time, we need to strengthen local and re uh, and regional uh, regional systems. You can work. You can work together at the, uh, at the global level and still create resilience. So uh, think global and act local, but um, I think what you said is very interesting. Uh, I mean, it's a lot about ambiguity and somehow I have the sense that there's two strong forces. One is this kind of nationalist forces with idols like Donald Trump and other politicians that very much focus on that. On the other hand, um, we see a truly a movement towards a global citizenship and uh, to understand that we can only solve the uh, the problems of this planet together across um, borders. So I understand that you are very much a global citizen and a global company. And so hopefully um, we will be able to, to shift more to this direction and uh, um, do something against national nationalism uh, in the future. But well, first you, of all, I think I'm I'm, a, I'm an internal optimist. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe maybe I'm naive, but uh, uh, I, I remain optimistic. And again, there are sometimes there are false dichotomies. So let's say if one person is saying to, to come back to our pandemic example, we can only solve such a problem at a global level, mm -hmm. and we need enhanced global cooperation of this. And another person is saying. We need to protect our country or our region, the EU, and that means that we need to have certain infrastructure here in place. Mm -hmm. Is this really? Uh, are, are these really two different points of mm -hmm. view? I think mm -hmm. one could do both. Yeah. So it's not an either or, but it's an and. You have to combine different approaches. Huh? So, final question. So, what if you could give? Our listeners, one advice, what would that be, Mr. Oshman? Well, I think we need to, why we're so much focused on crisis management and uh, um, sort of maybe uh, develop a little bit of a tunnel vision, which is sometimes good to get something really done. I think we need to keep our eyes and ears open and 
stay very curious because we have many challenges, many opportunities and many challenges in this uh, in this world. Be it this crisis we just talked about, be it climate change, etc. Et I personally believe that we need innovation, novel technologies to overcome these uh, to uh, overcome these crises. And I think it becomes plainly um, uh, uh, plainly evident right now. And how does how do we develop novel things if we are curious? Mm -hmm. And curiosity is a corporate value in our. Uh, in our uh, company, and we actually measure curiosity. And uh, I would encourage people stay stay curious, stay open, uh, stay open minded, embrace change. So it has been a true pleasure talking to you, and I think it has been really, really high value insights that you gave us, being really at the heart and being in the middle of all this, you know, kind of network that many others talk about. So you gave us really first-hand insights. Thank you very much, much Stefan Oschmann. Thank you. It was my pleasure.